everyone. Again, uh, with the beginning of the new year comes not only the winter travel season, but an opportunity to look back on our previous year. So during this meeting, we will hear about both winter promotions as well as some of the 2017 highlights. Ross will begin with an update <coughs> on his year-end travels and the I Love New York's winter marketing campaigns. And Kelly, the Director of Marketing, uh, Director of Market New York Grant Program, will brief us on Market New York Round 7. And we will hear from our guests, Bob Myron, um, from right here at the Empire State Development, and Michael Erdman from Longwoods. Welcome, Michael. Um, and then we will, they'll be explaining to us how and why New York State gathers um, the counts of the years, and visitors, and numbers, and spending. Um, I'd also like to welcome Donna Karen, who is the uh, SVP for Research and Analysis of NYC and Company, um, somebody who I've known from and had the pleasure of working with for many years and count on her numbers uh, quite often. And I'd like to um, take a few moments and brief you on the Governor's State of the State Address. As many of you know, Governor Cuomo's 2018 agenda was set forth in his eighth State of the State Address, which took place in Albany on January 3rd. In his address, Governor Cuomo again emphasized the importance of tourism to the state's economy and the returns the state is seeing from its investment in the industry. And this is significant, as there have been numerous State of the State Addresses prior to this, uh, Governor, that didn't even mention tourism. So it is a real credit to all of us and to him that Governor Cuomo used valuable time in his most high-profile speech of the year to highlight the importance of tourism. The governor is committed to continuing the state's investment in tourism and has proposed the following. Completing a new 136,000 square foot expo center at the New York State Fairgrounds, the largest, largest exhibition facility north of New York City between Boston and Cleveland. And the Expo Center will attract shows and special events that previously couldn't come to the region because of lack of suitable space. Yes. I would say that, Ross, yeah, we yeah. were on that together, right? We were. I wanted to point out that uh, Christine actually had a, a role in that, uh, and she was appointed officially to the governor's task force on redesigning the fair, and I was kind of backing up. Because Ross loves the fair. I love he goes the fair. every time. <laughs> I do. I love the fair. Um, Go to guy on and the so that, that was one of the recommendations from the task force. So thank thanks you. to Christine for helping that important and improvement come to pass. Thanks, Ross. And what's great to know about this expansion is also will allow the state fair to welcome groups during the winter season, which currently it cannot do. Um, so completing the Hudson, uh, he's also committed to completing the Hudson River Skywalk, a 1.8 mile scenic pedestrian trail that crosses the Hudson River, linking the Olana State Historic Site and the town of Greenport and the Thomas Cole National Historic Site in the village of Catskill. Investing in critical infrastructure improvements and additional year-round attractions at the New York State Ski Mountains and Olympic facilities. The governor's budget propose, proposal includes $62.5 million in new capital funding for ORDA, including $50 million for the strategic upgrade and modernization plan to support improvements to the Olympic facilities and ski resorts, $10 million for the critical maintenance and energy efficient upgrades, and $2.5 million appropriated from the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation budgets as part of the New York Works Initiative. Governor is also supporting the bill, the bid to bring the World University Games back to Lake Placid in 2013. Mr. Stone, back there. 2023. 2023. It's already been through 2013. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Just checking. Make sure you guys are paying attention. You can strike that from the minutes. <laughs> uh, providing the North County region with tools and resources to catalyze private investment. The goal is to bridge the gap in the North country's tourism lodging needs with $13 million in capital funding through the REDCs and Upstate Revitalization Initiative to spur development activity. He's also committed to modernizing, expanding, and rebuilding Stewart International Airport as New York International at Stewart Field. A $34 million investment by the Port Authority would increase access to world-class destinations and attractions throughout the Mid-Hudson Valley by supporting <coughs> upgrades like the construction <coughs> of a permanent U.S. Customs and Border Protection Federal Inspection Station. The governor also announced bringing the New York Islanders home with a world-class sports and entertainment destination at Belmont Park, also building a new Metro North Station at Woodbury Common, building an air train to create train-to-plane access at LaGuardia Airport, 
advancing the New York Parks 2020 initiative and creating a New York State Park on the shores of Jamaica Bay by investing $15 million to transform the former Pennsylvania and Fountain Avenue landfills <coughs> into the largest state park in all of New York City with 407 acres of land and 3.5 miles of paths and trails. So that is what he announced at the state of the state, but what I do want to say is just um, the work that we did over the weekend. So if anybody has any question about the commitment that this governor has for tourism, he was working around the clock uh, trying to, re mm -hmm. and, and he succeeded, mm -hmm. on keeping the Statue of Liberty opened uh, during the federal shutdown. As we know, the Statue of Liberty is uh, not only our iconic uh, beacon to welcoming the world, uh, it's, she stands for freedom, democracy, immigration. Um, it's also a gateway to many tourism from around uh, the world to come to New York City and then hopefully upstate. So we applaud the governor uh, on his efforts. Ross, thank you also for your effort over the weekend on uh, efforts on, over the weekend for getting that press release and all of the uh, logistics handled. So. Governor was at the battery yesterday. There was a press conference also this morning with um, statue cruises and folks from the battery. So at 9.30 this morning, <laughs> despite the federal government's efforts to shut down, um, there, the, the ferries were operating and uh, the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island were welcoming visit visitors. Awesome. So I now turn it over to Ross for a report of Isle of New York's winter marketing campaigns. Thank you. Um, and actually before that, um, it's sort of a, a follow-up to what Christine was talking about, the state of the state. The, those who know New York state government know kind of a one-two punch of the beginning of the year is uh, the state of the state address and then equally, some might argue more importantly, the budget address uh, because money sort of backs those things up. Um, so I want to give a, a bit of an update on that. That happened, uh, the governor, governor presented his executive budget proposal on Tuesday, January 16th. And the commitment that the governor displayed to tourism in his state of the state, fortunately, uh, was backed up uh, in the executive budget proposal as well. It, we're still going through the numbers, but so far so good. It's looking like tourism numbers are remaining fairly level. And considering that the state is facing a $4 billion deficit, that says a lot, I think, um, in terms of uh, a commitment to tourism. It's quite an accomplishment, given uh, that the state has that gap to make up plus all those exciting new things that the governor announced outside of tourism in the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the state. So uh, I think that's good news for us. So for example, you'll be hearing about Market New York from Kelly Baccarizzo in just a little bit because those announcements for the last round happened at the end of last year. Um, but that's an important grant program that gives money for local tourism projects, both capital and marketing. Um, that is remaining level at 15 million. So um, it looks like overall so far so good. I will look forward to reporting back uh, hopefully shortly after April 1st um, to let you know how things shook out once it, the budget goes through the process. But at least I think we're starting with a good foundation uh, and a continued commitment to tourism uh, in terms of what the governor's proposed around the budget. Before all those beginning of the year activities, uh, I actually finished 2017 doing a lot of traveling. Uh, even, before, even before the holidays, uh, 2017 was a very busy time um, and went to a number of tourism-related industry events across the state that I want to give you a quick update on. December 4th, for example, I was at the New York State Destination Marketing Organization's annual meeting. That's kind of the trade group for New York State that represents our DMOs across the state. Had a discussion and listening session with our local TPA and DMO partners. Um, first time I got to do that in, in the new job. Uh, December 5th, uh, there was an Adirondack Tourism Roundtable. This was put together by the Governor's Adirondack Office, kind of like a mini tourism summit for the Adirondacks, um, where I was able to hear from local tourism partners about their specific needs up in the North Country. Uh, December 6th was the opening of the Central New York uh, Welcome Center at Destiny USA. I'll be talking about that in just a minute. Um, and on December 7th, that's all the same week, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. <laughs> December 7th, uh, the Catskills Sullivan County Annual Meeting. Um, I addressed and spoke with tourism stakeholders. Uh, also got to tour some of the very exciting tourism construction projects happening in the Catskills. I don't know if anyone's uh, been in Sullivan County, that general region yet. Um, there's some really impressive stuff going on. Resorts International Casino Resort is on the brink of opening up. Uh, there is an indoor water park and a hotel just down the road that's being constructed by the same company that did Camelback in uh, the Poconos. 
Uh, and then not far away is the Yo One Luxury Wellness Resort. Um, and uh, it's this beautiful uh, high-end facility. Um, for example, they showed us one of the suites that has a massage room in your suite with a doorway that leads to the hallway so that you can go directly from your room into the massage room and your masseuse is waiting there for you. Didn't even have to come in your room because they came in from their own entrances. It's all pretty spectacular. Uh, you know, there's a floor, I believe, I think I was told at Resorts International that's literally the staff only speaks Mandarin because they're expecting a lot of Asian tourists. Um, there's planes being chartered to Stewart to serve this. These, these things really could be game changers. People in the Catskills are very excited about them. Um, literally, folks saying, you know, we've been working for decades, you know, on these kinds of things, and now finally the year is here. So expect to hear more, but it was exciting to be able to go there and see all that. Yeah, I took that exit um, the week before last just to drive around it, and it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And it, uh, the building is massive. Um, and the water park, you couldn't get really close to it, but it, you know, just like the drive up to it, um, there is a lot of use of nature, and there's also a nature preserve in there as well, isn't there? Or a wetlands preserve sure. or something? Yeah. There's there's something, um, there's some other wildlife sanctuary that's involved in it as well, which I think is going to be important. But there's yes, there's, I did hear that. Right, that was part of the idea was. Uh, as part of doing that land, that's right, there's, a, uh, there's going to be a park that's open. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a nature preserve in there as well. So it's, yeah. it's But it's, it's an, if you go off the exit, that's basically the only thing that's on that exit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so hopefully it will not impact traffic on 17, because it's a very, like, several miles till you actually get to the hotel on this, like, on this exit ramp. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, it's a very exciting developments. And, uh, but in addition to that fascinating part, you know, the idea of going to these other four events and actually being able to engage with the industry was uh, very good and exciting and satisfying because in general what I'm hearing out there is that folks are very pleased with what's happening in tourism uh, in New York State. Uh, I'm, I'm used to going on things and, and hearing complaints, frankly, not in this, <laughs> not in this capacity, sure. but in <laughs> other capacities of my life. That's what I'm used to going. Um, and in fact, I mean, there were certainly... Uh, lots of discussions about things to do bigger and better and different, uh, which is one of the reasons that it's great to go do these things. You know, I heard about a real interest in continuing to grow the partnership between I Love New York and our local partners so that the programs can be in alignment and reinforce each other. That, that what they're doing in the locals and to promote their local regions or even their counties, they very much want to be in alignment with the state. So that was very satisfying to hear. And, and you know, taking a look at how can we do that better? How can we make sure that our plans are clearly communicated to our partners locally so that they can uh, align strongly. Um, a lot of folks expressed uh, the importance of the I Love New York team uh, traveling uh, to trade shows, to industry events, uh, whether that be here in the state, nationally, internationally. They talk about how it's really important for New York State to be there. It means a lot for them and their efforts. Um, and there was certainly enthusiasm for the state efforts to grow tourism infrastructure, whether that be lodging, transportation, wireless, cell phone, broadband. These aren't issues that are new to this group. We've been talking about this for a while, but clearly the industry is reflecting that back. Heard that a lot in the North Country, in the Adirondacks. The idea of, you know, it seems like the marketing is at this great place after a number of years, and the next big step is how do we make sure that the infrastructure mm -hmm. is there, that when we're making this invitation for folks, that there is the, uh, the roads and the broadband and all these other things that are going to back up the invitation, allow there to be development, and allow there to be the tourism assets that need to be there. Um, but it was, like I said, certainly satisfying that wherever we went, whoever we went to, that even when people were talking about things to do better and different, they were all very good. It was like, but you're doing great. You're doing great. And it's like, well, that's not why I'm here. I'm actually here, here to hear how we can do better. But it still was very satisfying to hear that we're, we generally seem to be on the right track and the industry seems to be uh, pleased about where we are. So that was great. Um, so one of those uh, visits, as I mentioned, was for the ribbon cutting uh, that I got to do with the lieutenant governor of our latest welcome center. You've heard about these at previous tech meetings, um, you know, that there's already been <coughs> ones open in Long Island, in the Mohawk Valley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the newest, which I guess is number five at this point out of ten, um, is the Central New York one at Destiny USA, the super mall in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. So this was actually sort of a unique one. Most of them tend to be, uh, with the exception of Javits, 
tend to be freestanding structures on roadsides. And this one was actually integrated into what's already a, a really important tourism magnet. And you can see it here um, right over the pedestrian walkway from the parking lots into Destiny USA. So, and it has a lot of the common elements that you see at a lot of our uh, welcome centers. There's a, an artifact wall with sort of history uh, artifacts from the region and people being able to tell a little bit of the story of the history of the region. Um, a video wall. Um, in this case, you can see it's actually inside a uh, old silver stream. Is that what they're called? Yeah, the old antique campers. Airstreams. Airstreams. Yeah. Airstreams. <laughs> the old airstream. So that's, and you can see those little stumps there. Those are stools. And while I was there, I saw people sitting there watching the video of uh, great places to see and things to do in New York State. Um, and there, that's a, a little there. You can see people actually sitting, <laughs> enjoying that. Our video kiosks, as usual, with trivia contests, and find out what kind of traveler you are. Those continue to be there. And of course, can't have a, a, a welcome center without a Taste New York store. I got to buy my I Love New York ornament, which was proudly on my tree this year. Couldn't believe I didn't have one yet. But, uh, but that was a, a, another exciting event. Uh, that's uh, the map of the region and also a, a walk of fame. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a wall of fame of New Yorkers from the region. So that's... Uh, that was kind of, uh, that was a great visit, and it was great to see. And uh, this will continue opening welcome centers across the state. Um, winter marketing obviously has begun since we last met. It's that time of year. Um, currently, we're on air uh, with our, our winter commercial, five-hour, as usual. We're, it's broadcasting in our five-hour drive uh, radius market. Um, this year, the, the name of the ad this year is Most Ski Mountains and touting the idea of New York has more ski mountains than any state in the nation. Um, in past years, you'll remember our ads very much would often focus on one or two ski regions. <clears throat> this year, we wanted to get across the idea of that wherever you are in New York State, whatever major metropolitan area you are in, you are a mile away from great ski. Um, and so I wanted to be able to show you that ad. This winter, in the state with more ski mountains than any other, Family fun reaches a new peak. So whether you're a speed demon or more of a snow angel, your winter chariot awaits. Pick the best peak for your family getaway at ILoveNY.com. New York State. It's all here. It's only here. So that's running now, and we'll, we'll continue really running for a number of weeks and hopefully get that point across of even if people haven't made vacation plans yet or getaway plans yet this winter, uh, we're ready. We're ready and eager to have you. Um, the other last thing I just wanted to touch on quickly was uh, we're just a week away from the New York Times Travel Show. Uh, it's, it, it's the oh good. Um, it's the main consumer show that we do at I Love New York. Uh, it's a great audience for us because uh, it's really reaching those New York City folks. Um, and talking to them about making vacation plans at a good time, early enough to get them to do that. Friday's press day, so we do a lot of uh, media interviews that day. Um, you can see this is some of the mock-ups of the aisle branding. There's actually going to be a, a, an Isle of New York cart that you can walk in. Um, it was only We only started doing this show, I think, a couple of years ago, Mark Lee, is that right? Three. Three years ago. And each year we've kind of built the presence. Um, trying to really brand us as having an Isle of New York area. We're thrilled that we've taken the next step with that here. Um, there's still more to go, but uh, step by step, we have a bunch of partners um, who are going to be with us from all over the state, um, selling their areas to uh, the folks who are attending. Um, and uh, so it should be a great event. So January 26th through the 28th, by all means, come by and see us. So that is my... Uh, quick overview of uh, some of the latest happenings since we met just two months ago. Great. Thank you, Ross. Any questions for Ross? Okay. Moving on to Kelly Baccarizzo, uh, the Director of Market New York Grant Program, has been very busy lately with the announcement of Market New York Round 7 awardees earlier in December. Um, unfortunately, Kelly's not able to join us here in person, but she's on the line to give us an update. So, Kelly... Are you yes, us? good afternoon to everybody. Hi. Can, can you hear me down there? Yep, sound yep. great. <clears throat> You're all okay, set. For, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the Regional Economic Development Council, or otherwise known as the REDC, or to some people the Red Seas, <clears throat> the process um, was established in uh, 2011 by Governor Cuomo 
as a new way of doing economic development in New York State uh, that is more focused on bottom-up instead of top-down economic development planning. The RADCs are made up of business leaders, academics, and elected officials. The CFA, otherwise known as the uh, Consolidated Funding Application, is one application online that allows uh, applicants to apply for multiple streams of state economic development uh, monies through one process. This year's awards were announced uh, December 13th, and over $800 million in state resources were made available in 2017 to support the economic development priorities of the regions and spur job creation across the state. <clears throat> Market New York is a subset of the C CFA and was started specifically to strengthen tourism and attract <coughs> visitors to New York State through the promotion of destinations, attractions, and special events. Funding through Market New York is available for marketing projects, capital projects, special events, including meetings, conventions, conferences, festivals, agritourism and uh, craft beverage events, athletic competitions, and consumer and industry trade shows. <coughs> Excuse me. Round seven was the first year that agritourism projects were highlighted and funded up to $2 million. Initially, when Market New York, uh, the pro grant program began uh, six years ago, there was only $3 million available, but it has grown to $15 million awarded for programs that will take place in 2018 and 2019. That $15 million in Market New York funding that was awarded just this past December went to 61 tourism projects. <clears throat> Those projects were broken down into close to $7 million for marketing to 46 different regional, regional recipients. Uh, close to $7 million for capital projects to 18 different recipients, up to $1 million for multiple special events in various regions, and up to $2 million uh, for close to 18 projects for agritourism craft beverage projects. Some examples of successful tourism projects that received awards <laughs> in this last round include the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, a three-day special event in the Mid-Hudson region, Corning Museum of Glass's 2018 Glass Barge statewide tour from Brooklyn to Corning, New York, via the Hudson River, Erie Canal, and the Finger Lakes. The Long Island Regional Wine Tourism Marketing Project, awarded to the Long Island Wine Council. New York State 2018-19 Winter Tourism Marketing Program, awarded to Ski Areas of New York, otherwise known as SADI. The Utica Zoo Primate Building Capital Program. <coughs> Brewery Old Magong's upgrade and enhancement capital project for their brewery destination experience in order to better serve their guests and draw more visitors to the overall region. An important uh, note that the $15 million for Market New York is only one small piece of the REDC projects that influence tourism. Over $114 million for 371 projects were, sub uh, were also granted to substantially tourism-related projects. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And actually, before that, I, I just want to uh, give a thanks and a shout out uh, to Kelly. Um, you know, at this point, between managing uh, the projects that are currently happening, the ones coming up, the ones that are a couple of years ago and still being caught up, mm -hmm. it's about $100 million worth of grants that she's managing. Uh, we just recently got her attempt to help her, but it was her alone, and now there's a, a very talented attempt helping her as well. Um, but it's an amazing amount of work. Um, it's a great project that, as you can tell, um, you know, there were 100 some odd awards and 200 some odd applications. Well, I guess it was 60 awards, right, Kelly? In the end, in Mark and New York? 60. Yes. Right. So yes. 200 some odd applications for 60 awards. This is a very competitive process. That, I think, is a sign that uh, there's an interest in it, there's a need for it, um, and you can hear the sort of projects that are happening. They're really exciting <laughs> things. And, and just, I, I just want to point out, just because you hear a particular category, like event or agritourism, doesn't mean it has, doesn't have crossover to other things. So, for example, and correct me if I'm misremembering, Kelly, but I believe there's, like, for example, a, an agritourism project that actually involves a historic museum that is going to do something about, like, historic brewing or something, right? So there's all kinds of interesting things that happen. Um, it's, it's a really great project. Terrific. Any questions? I just have one, one question, Kelly. Let's say that uh, an application gets rejected. Are they then 
permitted to reapply the following year? Absolutely. In fact, we provide them with um, some general information, but specific to their application as to why their application may have been weak or not as successful as the applicants who did receive grants, and we, um, we encourage everyone to apply again in the next round. Terrific. And you want to remind us where we can find a full list of the, uh, the awardees? Uh, I believe it is available. Um, it's not available on the I Love New York site. It's all held on the uh, the Governor's Regional Council site, which is Regional Councils with an S dot N Y dot G O V. I think if you also just Google search R E D C Market New York, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can find it pretty easily. It, there. it is. Yeah. It is. It's, I, I encourage folks to take yeah. a look. I mean, like like we said, it's sixty one different projects. Yeah. You'll see literally the wide range, right? Which isn't shouldn't be surprising that's tourism right we have to do everything from you know camping to ballet right it's literally everything question were there many uh, cooperative applications meaning by multiple counties or even multiple regions working together do you hear that Kelly yes um not as many as you would probably think because the way that the regional council is set up um, they have to apply within their region so we don't see as many multiple regions outside of now we are also talking in you know in, in our group here we have tourism regions and in the regional council they have economic development regions so they have to applicants have to be mindful of both of those regions and the way the scoring is set up the regional Economic Development Councils also have um, 20 points to the 100 total points in the scoring system. So there's not as many multi-regional projects, multi-counties, yes, but less multi-regional than you would uh, than you would think in the tourism side of things. But the the multi-county we do see, right? Yes, absolutely. Multi counties that within the same economic development region. The other thing we'll see is there are actually some statewide initiatives. So you heard about uh, the Ski Association in New York, I believe the Campground Association in New York. They actually do statewide initiatives. What they kind of do is find a home region that is particularly impacted or particularly interested in that project, and that will be kind of become the, the home sponsor, as it were. Um, and that REDC will say, hey, this is really important, and so we we're scoring it well, we want to see it happen, recognizing though that it may be very well a statewide effort, um, that it's the Campground Owners Association uh, promoting the entire state at campground shows across the nation, or you know something that's going to benefit all the ski slopes. So there's, it's tricky, uh, but there are, are a number of different interesting ways that you can get to uh, the idea. And certainly it's encouraged. The idea is, you know, this is supposed to impact regions not just a county, not just an attraction. The idea is, how is this going to change the tourism and impact the tourism for an entire region? Well, thank you very much, Kelly. And thank you. I'm very excited now to welcome Bob Myron and Michael Erdman uh, as our guest speakers. Uh, Bob is the Commerce Policy Analyst and Research Manager for I Love New York, and Michael is the Senior Vice President of research at Longwoods International, the firm that we contract with to collect our tourism data. Uh, we've asked them to be here today because, um, you know, through some of the past meetings that we've had, questions have come up, well, how do we, how do we come up with our visitor numbers? How is spending counted? Um, and that'll be the focus of the presentation. Uh, the presentation isn't so much as an analysis or implication of what New York State's numbers are, but uh, that might be better done in 2017 later on when we have, uh, or in, later on in 2018 when we have the 2017 numbers um, available in the springtime. Um, but we've had discussions at previous meetings, and I know that from my work at NYC and company, this sometimes comes up at executive meetings or board meetings, you know, so it's always good to have a refresher course, and I think in January, when we're all gung-ho for the new year and excited about learning and open minds, we want to know, all right, so how do we figure out, like, how these visitors come and, and you know, are, how are the numbers backed up? So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to, to Bob and Michael, and we really appreciate your coming in for this meeting. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, 
So, as Christine said, my name is Bob Myron, and I'm the I'm calling myself the research manager, not my official title. Um, I work in a policy group, and my focus is tourism. Um, so, uh, we purchase uh, a variety of data to understand uh, how we're doing in tourism. We purchase uh, visitor visitor profile data, visitor volume data. Um, from Longwoods, we've used other sources in the past. We purchase uh, economic impact data from a company called Tourism Economics. We've been with them for quite a while. And then we also purchase uh, hotel performance, hotel industry data from a company called STR, Smith Travel Research. Um, so all of this data allows us to kind of measure how we're doing. Um, uh, both the visitor volume and the economic impact data is retrospective, meaning that uh, I will get the data for 2017 in May-ish of 2018. So really what we're doing is looking back and saying, okay, we've got wonderful commercials, we've got all these initiatives, all this glitzy, interesting stuff going on that looks like a lot of fun. So wh what happened? Uh, how, you know, how, how many people came? How much money did they spend? How are we doing? Um, so, um, I mean, it would be ideal, obviously, if we had more real-time kind of data, but trying to measure visitors is not a simple task, particularly when you're talking about a geography as big as New York State. It's not simple at the city level, but at least uh, in the city there's uh, fewer points of entry and you've got other ways to kind of cross-reference. Um, so, you know, wh why do we count? We count because uh, the governor and the people of the state of New York give us a lot of money, and we have to uh, show that we are shepherding and using that money effectively and efficiently. Um, and uh, it's, it's been refreshing for somebody who's worked in uh, Isle of New York for a while to see the governor's commitment because he has provided us the funds to be able to really do an effective job in marketing and measuring and other activities. Um, and we do this because it's a very competitive industry. Um, obviously, uh, if you in the winter, we all are exposed to these beautiful Florida beaches and other wonderful places that uh, want our tourism dollars to go to. Uh, uh, you know, Visit Florida spends uh, millions and millions of dollars attracting visitors. Um, California, Texas, all these states have substantial investments in doing exactly what we're doing is trying to attract uh, the, the tourist dollar, the visitor dollar, to choose us over uh, alternatives. Um, so um, so I, I just have a couple of uh, some uh, uh, overviews here. Uh, tourism really, like many other industries, is a uh, uh, what I'm calling the, the, the increases are, are slow and steady. As you can see from here, from 2010 through 2016, which is the most recent numbers we have, um, we've gone from 196 million visitors in the state to 239 million visitors. The, the top red part is the international side of things. The, the blue part is domestic. Uh, Longwoods provides us data on the domestic side. On the international side, luckily, we're able to get that from the U.S. Department of Commerce, and some, there's some other sources where we get that data. Um, but that's uh, approximately a 3.3% growth rate um, uh, every year since 2010. So we've been consistently increasing over time, and obviously we want to continue to to show positive trends. Uh, the next slide, um, this is visitor spending. So this is direct visitor spending as measured by tourism economics. And now well, the reason I threw this up there, again, same kind of consistent growth year over year, um, and if, if you look at, if you compare the size of the red uh, portion of the, of the uh, column there, you can see international visitors, though they represent 10% uh, of uh, vis visitors in terms of volume to the state of New York, they represent uh, closer to 25% of the total spending. Uh, why is that? That's because <coughs> international visitors come here for a long period of time compared to the average domestic visitor. Uh, their length of stay is much longer. Uh, international visitors largely are not staying in the campground or with friends and family. They're staying in hotels. So we're putting 
heads and beds, as they say, um, and they're spending money in retail and other establishments. So um, certainly I know New York City and New York State also were very concerned um, about uh, the recent presidential election and how that might impact uh, international visitors to the state. And as you can see, there a uh, little bit of uh, a dip in 2015. That was really more related to uh, the exchange rate and Canadian visitors coming to the state of New York. Um, but uh, largely, we have kind of weathered the storm, I think, thus far in 2016. The numbers, though not increasing, are, seem to be holding fairly stable. Um, but they, uh, as I said, they do represent a hugely important part um, of, of our market and our spending. Markley Wilson, of course, does a great job in, in heading up that division for us. So, uh, um, you know, congratulations to him for his efforts. Uh, the next slide, um, here's another piece. Now, the hotel room data is much more timely than the economic impact and the uh, visitor data that we get uh, so um, usually about the middle of the month, I get data on what happened previously. So what this slide shows is um, there's a lot of different pieces of data in the hotel report. Uh, the one that I'm most focused on is rooms sold. So uh, really just comparing what were the total n number of rooms sold in 2015 to, to 2016, um, mo you know, for each month through the year. So what this shows is... Blue line is New York City, the red line is New York State, and the uh, darker gray line is the U.S. So in every month um, in 2016, uh, the increase in the number of rooms sold, both in New York City and New York State, uh, were higher than the U.S. average. So that shows you, at least compared to the U.S. average, New York State is, is doing an effective job because we are selling more rooms. Um, now this... It doesn't have anything really to do with occupancy. There's a lot of other pieces of data, but this is just uh, because occupancy is, a, is, is impacted by both supply and demand. This is really just number of rooms sold. So as you can see, um, in New York City, I mean, you've got increases up to 8 and 10 percent year over year, which is tremendous. I mean, um, and in, in New York State, um, you know, you can see that our, our numbers – increasing our between 4 and kind of 6% throughout the year. So that kind of growth speaks volumes to uh, why, you know, we have increased visitors and we have increased spending. Um, so um, so part, a large part of my job is kind of managing and maintaining this, this information that we get in-house and then responding to questions that we may have. Um, the visitor... Uh, the economic impact data we get is luckily available at the county level, which means it's available at the tourism region level. So that data is then sent out to all of our tourism partners across the state, and uh, they get information on spending, and on employment, on the wages within the industry. So this is very helpful to them to prove to the folks that they're dealing with at the county level or regional level that they're doing a good job because um, they need to – it's, it's uh, numbers that they can use to show the impact of their efforts uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, you know, some of the other um, – we talk, you know, why do we do this? Um, obviously, it's an, it's an easy metric to understand. How many people came to, to New York State last year compared to the year before? People ask that question all the time, and so we try to provide that information – um, it allows us to compare our activity to what other states are doing, um, and it also allows us to you know, figure out how we're going to utilize our, our marketing resources. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned pr with program justification, we need defensible numbers, so we go with uh, you know, industry-recognized uh, uh, companies that are using the latest and greatest techniques to try to get accurate and valid numbers. Um, and certainly we want to uh, measure um, the economic impact of, of what we're doing um, because tourism is employing over 900,000 people in the state of New York. Um, so it impacts a lot of folks in a lot of industries. So, um, you know, very important job. 
I know Gavin Landry, our old boss, used to remind us all the time at staff meetings, there are a lot of people counting on us for doing our job effectively. Um, so I, I think uh, it's, it's important to remember and understand that. Um, so uh, that's kind of an overview of uh, the data we, some of the data we collect. There's other research that we do on advertising and other kinds of things. I'm not really going to get into that at this point. Um, but I wanted to bring uh, Michael Erdman uh, here. Uh, he's with Longwood's company that we do business with, um, and he's going to go through a little bit more in detail about the methodology, how they actually uh, come up with counting the numbers and, and getting us uh, uh, accurate uh, estimates of visitors in New York State. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Um, just introduction introduction to me. Um, I've been with Longwoods since 1986, if you can believe it. I'm a lifer. Um, <laughs> my background was in political economy, so I naturally fell into uh, public policy research. I worked for every branch of government you can imagine, from the military to fisheries and oceans <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but I also had clients when I came to Longwoods, like um, hotels, uh, Air Canada, the airline, um, and Travel Alberta, which in those days, if you can imagine, was spending over a million dollars on tourism research. Wow. Who has a budget of a million dollars? <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yeah, I'm <laughs> um, jealous. <laughs> so over the years, I've helped create some of our products, including Travel USA, which I'll give you a, a basic primer on over the next little bit, uh, as well as our other products that, that we sell. Um, and at, at the moment, I oversee virtually everything that goes out the door. So I'm a, hopefully, it keeps me busy. Longwoods is, uh, we started in Toronto, and we now have offices um, across the United States. Our, our U.S. headquarters are in uh, Columbus, Ohio. We began in 1978. We tested everything uh, under the sun, including dog food, but we eventually settled in a vertical market called tourism, travel and tourism. Um, but we're not just counting heads and, or beans. We are doing other things like uh, image and branding research. Some of you may also have encountered us in the measurement of the ROI of advertising campaigns and, and marketing. Our consultants are just uh, researchers like myself, uh, but they're including people that are very connected to the industry uh, our U.S. president is Amir Elon, who used to be travel director for the state of Ohio, and uh, George Zimmerman is on staff, and he was uh, with Travel Michigan and created that wonderful campaign, Pure Michigan. Um, our client list includes, at any one time, probably about a third of the U.S. states. Uh, we go all the way from Ohio, Ohio to Rhode Island and most of the places in between over the course of time. Um, also many large cities, including Vegas, uh, L.A., uh, New York City, uh, and uh, well, you can read better than I can. Before I get into uh, the detail, uh, earlier Bob talked about why we measure visitor volume and expenditures. Let's talk about what it involves and how we eventually get there. The starting point is really basic. Uh, you can count visitors, you can count actual heads if you've got a, a place that's catered, right? If you're an island or a country, you've got to cross a border, you've got to get off a boat or a plane, you can count those people. But what happens if you're not gated? If you've, you're a city like New York where you've got umpteen ways of getting into the city, and you also have no way of differentiating between people that are there for leisure or for business and those that people, people who actually live in the place. So what we're doing then is estimating. And estimating involves replicating in some systematic and defensible way the universe of people that are coming in. Right? So it's not just sort of picking... Every, every person that comes across the bridge and interviewing them is taking a selection or a representation of the total. Ultimately, what we want to get is a percentage 
of people that represent your market share or the incidence or the frequency of visiting you and then be able to multiply by the population. I'll give you an example in consumer goods terms. Let's say that you're launching a new uh, chewing gum. You do a survey and you get 20% strong interest in buying your product. Then we figure out how many people in the population are in your target audience. We multiply by the percent that are really interested in it, and we say, okay, you've got 40 million potential sales the first time you go out to launch. So that's similar to what we're doing here. We're finding out how many people, what percent of people um, meet your criteria, come to New York, and we're multiplying by the population. How we get there in a bit. So, back up, Kelly. Okay. Um, can you believe that it's been uh, it, 10 years ago, there was no standardized way of counting or accounting for visitation to places across the world. Everybody did it differently. So about um, 1988 or thereabouts, and over a 20-year period, the World Trade Organization started to formulate standardized methods of coming up with estimates of tourism economic impact. I mean, ultimately, what jurisdictions and stakeholders wanted was an understanding of how big travel and tourism was in the overall context of other industries. It had never been done like that before. It had always been, well, we're tourism and we're this big. We had n never understood how tourism fit in relative to other industries. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but we ended up with something called the tourism satellite account methodology. Tourism sa the, the notion of satellite is a very interesting word. It doesn't mean anything other than if you have an accounting system, it's sort of like the side page that represents tourism. That's all. There's nothing magic about the words tourism satellite account. But the methodology evolved and was finalized in around 2008, and virtually all the tourism-ready um, countries in the world now use this methodology. A number of U.S. states and a lot of sub-regions uh, have adopted it as well. Um, when you standardize, you need consistent terms, definitions, and ways of describing things. Well, first of all, what's a trip? So a family of three comes to New York City. Is that three trips or is that one trip? Well, the World Trade Organization finally decided that it is three person trips. Now, if you read some of our weird little travel reports, you may see the words 10 million person trips. That's the equivalent of 10 million visitors or 10 million travel travelers. So the words are equal. Um, then we had to figure out how to count overnight and day trips. The most important trip is an overnight trip because that's heads and beds. People spend more money as, as you described. Uh, day trips are also important, but they're a little bit more difficult to quantify because you know, you're, you're traveling, you're commuting, so how do you count a day trip? So the definition became a trip that's out of the ordinary, and one of the ways that we have of differentiating it from commuting, for instance, is by travel distance. So now, what do we do about overnight trips? Do we include a distance criterion or not? Well, when we were, when we were back in, that, in those days when these things were being argued out and decided, uh, we lobbied against a distance criteria because one of our clients then was New Jersey. Now, think of New Jersey and where its visitors come from. Most, I would say 50%, 60% of all, all visitation, overnight visitation to New Jersey comes from New York City, metro area, or Philadelphia. Now, if you say there's a 50 mile dis dif distance screen, how many visitors do you have left? So now the definition 
fortunately includes anybody that stays anywhere overnight that's not your home. Okay? Um, so how do research firms go about estimating volume these days? Now, you've probably encountered in consultants' reports over the years several different methodologies. There's sort of on-site or street intercept interviews, like you're in an attraction or you're in a hotel a lobby and somebody comes up to you and wants to ask you questions about your, your trip. There are accommodation surveys. Um, Bob mentioned STR uh, trip um, estimation. They tend to be focused on brand properties, you know, uh, hotels, motels that have brand names. There's tax-based modeling. I mean, um, econometric firms go in and look at tax data and then they model backwards to come up with estimates of how much was spent uh, in different industries, you know, food and beverage, accommodations, etc. And maybe they'll come up with an estimate of the number of visitors. Generally not likely. And then there are custom ad hoc surveys that uh, a destination will order up on a periodic basis, uh, but it's not regular. All of these have <laughs> issues with representativeness of the whole of your visitation and the completeness of the data set. Like, as I mentioned, like street intercepts. If you're outside of attractions, you're not necessarily going to get people visiting friends and relatives or people not visiting attractions, right? If you're going to high-end accommodations or brand name accommodations, you're missing the people that stay in bed and breakfast or with friends and relatives or inns or uh, campgrounds. Our solution and that of our competitors, uh, the major competitors, is to do national, ongoing, large-scale surveys. Um, Longwoods, uh, if you're familiar with our product, it's, uh, Travel USA is the largest ongoing survey of travel behavior uh, in America. And it was syndicated, which means that multiple organizations, destinations, DMOs, participate in order to keep the cost down. It's like an omnibus survey. Uh, you participate, you buy space, as it were, and um, you take part, but you're not paying the full freight for the whole thing. Uh, something that might cost you 100000 to do on our survey might cost you twenty. Um, and we have consistent data, consistent measures that start back in 1994. Why national coverage? Well, destinations want to know about all the visitors that come to their place, not just the ones that stay in the major hotels or who are easier to talk to. We know that visitors coming to New York uh, come from every state of the Union. For New York and all our clients, the best approach, the gold standard, with the least skews, is to talk to large, representative, randomly generated samples of visitors. Why large? Well, in any survey research, you're trying to generate defensible numbers. Can you make marketing decisions if you've got, if you represent a corporation around the board here? Uh, would you make decisions about your marketing if there was a spread of plus or minus 10% in the data? It's pretty hard to make informed decisions if you've got uh, data that's not precise enough. So travel surveys, uh, in the, at the large scale, we're trying to get your margin of error down to less than even uh, a tenth of one percent. To generate these samples, we use large consumer panels. More on that in a bit. Uh, we end up with Travel USA with a sample of 300,000, 310, 325,000 trips per year, overnight and day trips on a national basis, of which 70, um, 15,000 are from New York State trips overnight, and 7,500 are day trips. So we have a really large pool of respondents that we can uh, profile in order to come up with estimates and provide further information for you. One of the major outputs of a national sample is a total national estimate of travel. So then we can take your portion of that, 
calculate a market share, multiply against the population of the United States that travels to come up with the final estimate. That's the magic number. So why do we use consumer panels? Well, I don't know if you've ever tried to do door-to-door -door surveys or telephone surveys lately, but a lot of people won't open the door anymore to interviewers at their front door. And people uh, don't like to talk a lot on the phone these days. You know, if you can keep people for three or four minutes maximum, you're lucky. These types of techniques used to be used for travel surveys, but over year, the years they've declined because of expense and also because the declining response rates have, have just made them impractical. It affects data reliability. <coughs> um, panels also provide a large-scale replication of the universe that we're interested in. Panels are uh, managed universes. They incent people to take surveys. They're normally a group of people that are chosen to represent the, uh, the diversity of America. Uh, the proportions based on census data so that um, we have a representative pool of people to draw from. We use the largest panel company in the world called uh, Survey Sampling International. Uh, they've now merged with Research Now, and they've got probably 8 million or more households and individuals under their panel roof. And so we can then uh, safely draw, I think we contact probably about 2 million potential respondents over the course of a year in our surveys. So that gives us a good random selection. These panels are backed by very large companies with huge research budgets. So, you know, we're not inventing the wheel here. Um, companies like um, uh, Procter & Gamble, General Foods, General Mills, J.D. Power, all use these huge panels for their research. With the gradual demise of door-to-door -door interviewing and telephone, uh, panels have become the go-to methodology for gathering consumer data since around uh, the 1990s. Gradual migration, if, you're, if you grew up with me back in the 80s in market research, uh, it used to be called mail panel. Some of you youngsters probably don't even know what mail is. Um, but we used to get surveys in the mail and tick them off and send them back, and, and that's how we did it. Um, we eventually migrated away from that to online surveying uh, in the early 2000s, after lots of checking back and forth to make sure that we were uh, okay. Now, most destinations uh, don't want to know just about visitor volume, right? That sort of justification data, that's fine. Um, so we gather additional data uh, as well on expenditures, trip characteristics, trip planning, uh, you know, how long the trip is, uh, what types of activities you did on your trip, uh, who was in your travel party, how old were they, your demographics, and a couple of other important uh, pieces of information. Now, when we started our Travel USA pre uh, precursors, most places were satisfied with getting information in those days, back in the early 80s, mid-80s, on how many visitors came from leisure versus business. Well, I mean, that's what countries do. You know, they're, they're really collecting, they don't have a lot of time to collect information on you. It's mainly related to the visas of people coming in, right? So uh, travel research companies, even to this day, generally just give you a breakdown between leisure and business. We dis discovered something very interesting back in our uh, research on research days before we set up Travel USA that has actually revolutionized how you can market using research. Leisure travel is actually occasion-based. In the old days, and I think there are some remnants of it around, um, people assumed that if you were a city destination, you had to market to city-type people. You know, these are, and so you had the segmentation that did psychographics that, that identified, you know, double income, no kids groups and, and all. And everybody was trying to focus on the individual who met what you thought your profile was. 
But what we discovered is that you can take different types of trips for different purposes. The same person can take a city trip one weekend, go camping with the kids two weekends away, and go to a resort vacation in the winter and be the same person. Each of those trip purposes, though, have an entirely different set of wants and needs. So if you understand the size of those segments and how important they are to your destination and the characteristics and the wants and needs of the people that are, are interested in going on, uh, on those trips, then you can market with a rifle rather than a shotgun. So we've built into our surveys now on a routine basis since 94, trip purpose segments, 10 different segments for leisure, uh, and these are, are segments that are apart from visits to friends and relatives. Um, Bob and I were talking about the notion of marketable trips. Um, when you visit a, friends and, a friend or a relative, you go to them because they are friends and relatives. You don't choose the destination. What you really want to work on are those people where you've got some leverage, and those are the people that take discretionary leisure trips. And those are the main types of trips that I'm talking about here. Um, when you try to measure travel, as I mentioned earlier, you, you invariably come across the issue of day trips. And normally, trips, uh, uh, surveys that are talking about travel, they routinely underestimate the number of day trips. Well, can you imagine? New York City, if you, if you say, well, there, there aren't very many day trips, they would look at you like you're crazy. Um, day trips account for upwards at least 10% of all economic activity for most destinations. So getting it right is really important. Um, we figured out about 10 years ago uh, through a combination of uh, questionnaire design, questionnaire order, and other uh, methods of making sure that respondents talk to us about all trips. And so now the numbers that, that we report make sense. Surveys about travel and past behavior obviously uh, require memory. And uh, respondent memory, unfortunately, tends to fade. So we figured out a long time ago that the optimal timing of our surveys should not be asking respondents to talk about any more than about the past three months. So you'll see for us and for most of, uh, of our competitors, quarterly surveys are the way to go. Also, what it does, if you, ask, uh, uh, if you do surveying every th three months, is you make sure that you get a representative selection of travel across an entire year. It's not just peak summer or winter travel. You're talking to uh, tourists that are coming on every quarter of the year. Sometimes you need to jog people's memory to get them to remember where they went. For New York State and for other clients, we use <coughs> lists of destinations. Uh, we use maps that go even down to, well, for New York State, we use tourism regions that show each, all of the, the uh, regions, even sub-regions in detail. For New York City, we even go down to the borough level to make sure that we get people to lock in and determine where exactly they went on their vacations. Self-completion online surveys. They've really become uh, the standard way of doing research for most consumer categories these days. Um, it doesn't involve an interviewer anymore. Travel surveys are pretty simplistic. You get to check, check off, write in numbers, type in numbers, I mean, and uh, you know, ask very simple questions. It doesn't require an interviewer uh, to inter uh, be an intermediary or to probe or anything like that. Um, it's very interesting in travel surveys. We can talk to people about travel for a long time because people love to, travel, uh, love to travel and they love to talk about their trips. So even a 45-minute survey is usually no problem for people. 
uh, and we can ask a lot of detailed questions. We can also show images to people to jog their memory or videos. A lot of our travel surveys uh, include videos uh, or concepts. So if you wanted to explore in custom surveys attitudes or responses to things that you're thinking about, we can provide people with detailed things that you couldn't in, say a telephone interview. So we're near the end of the process. Field work's done. The data is in tabulation. So what do we do? Uh, we're getting ready to provide the final estimates. To get there, we put data through, I would say, rigorous set of analyses and cleaning processes to make sure that we're including only valid responses, uh, that uh, this, the outliers have been cleaned, that by the time you get the results, we've looked at other markers, like Smith Travel data, other estimates that are out there, tax data. Now, we're consultants. We're not going to just hand you a, a deck and say, well, this says you're down, but everything else, everybody else says you're up, and we can't explain it. So, you know, we, we make sure that we understand how and why. As an example of how well our numbers stack up, um, Tourism Economics, uh, one of your suppliers, and they're also one of the, the nation's most respected uh, tourism and travel economist firms, uh, they routinely use our volume estimates as inputs in their economic modeling. And just as an example of how close you can come to being uh, similar to a border count, for instance, I recently did some research for a destination that was targeting um, uh, visitors from China in five particular cities. By the end of the study, my estimates from those five cities came within 5% of this country's border counts from those. It worked out. Yeah. To sum up, ultimately, our goal is to provide you with defensible estimates that make sense to your stakeholders. I hope that this has provided you with at least a non-technical overview, uh, something that's accessible for you to understand how we get to where we, we want to go. I'm sure you've got questions, and if we've got time, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, Michael. I, I figured we'd ask um, Donna as well while we're, you know, on, on the New York side, on the New York City side, if, um, if, if NYC and company gets the same, you know, uses the same methodology and how you check your data. Sure. As well. um, thank you. Uh, it's a delight to come on after people who have explained what we do and um, some of the ways we look at it. Um, New York City is in a unique position. Uh, the state, New York State, is the number two state in the U.S. for international arrivals. It is obviously one of the most popular domestic destinations as well. Within both of those categories, New York City is at the top of the list. We are the number one international destination in the United States with, um, we're estimating now for 2017, you heard the keyword estimate, you heard from my colleagues on why that's important, um, slightly a drop in visitation compared to 2016, but 12.6 million international visitors. That is the city of Miami and L.A. combined with room to spare. So we use a Department of Commerce product that Bob talked about. On the domestic side, um, we have fewer domestic visitors than a place called Orlando. <laughs> but anyone who's heard me talk will know that I say the difference is 10 million children who don't have credit cards in their own name. <laughs> <laughs> and because what we are are regions looking at economic development and businesses looking at our bottom line, the spending becomes completely um, the focus of so much of what we do. So we have worked at a couple of different levels. 
there are local level regular reports, the Smith Travel Research hotel data, which comes in weekly. Um, I have 30 plus years of monthly hotel data from a company that used to be called PKF and is now part of CBRE, the real estate firm. We get weekly data from Broadway, and some of you may have seen the recent report. Broadway tells us basically what percent of its audience is local, domestic, or international. So you're hearing me talk about some of the same cross-checking that Bob and Mike just talked about. Um, we subscribe to a number of syndicated research sources, airline passenger data. Mm -hmm. um, Ralph is here from the Port Authority, but also passport control data um, from the U.S. government. Where are people coming from and where are those flights coming from? We look at tax collections and attendance at attractions, Statue of Liberty being one of them that's also um, both public and private data. There's the Hornblower cruises out to the statue, and there's the Parks Department data. All of that goes into a word I love to say, an econometric model. Um, I love the multisyllabic piece. Um, no single data source for a product as diverse and big as New York City, and arguably for the state with its multiple regions, can survive on a single data point or a single perspective. So tourism economics, um, I've been working with their founding uh, founder since 2002. We've been working with Tourism Economics as a company, I think, since 2004. Um, they do this model for us. And so one of the things about it is that while the large syndicated surveys work really well at the memory level for I went to New York State or I visited the United States, um, Sometimes the surveys say, well, where did you go on that trip? And if you're an Australian who lands in LAX and spends nine weeks in the United States, <laughs> you get to New York, you've run out of lines in the survey to list the places you've been. So we look at multiple ways to get touch points. And one of the most valuable things we've added to the mix in the last few years is something called Visa View Travel. And I think um, I've talked to a number of the destinations around the state about this. Visa, not hyping the Visa credit card, but they are the largest credit card issuer in the world with more than a billion cardholders worldwide. And their benefit is that all transactions are centrally processed by Visa. And they have figured out how to make that a travel-friendly product. So on a quarterly basis, I know how many Visa cards and Visa debit cards were used in New York City <laughs> by 170 countries, including Puerto Rico, because Visa considers it a country, Vatican City, which has its own banking system, and a few other interesting small markets, but also every U.S credit card issued by an American bank, and we pull out the regional New York City, Metro New York, that 50-mile radius that you talked about. So Northern Westchester kind of touches the 50-mile limit, um, but what we pulled out were the five borough New York City numbers to get a sense of where, how many cards where are they coming from? What is the spending? You put that next to attractions, to hotels, to arrivals, to train tickets, Amtrak non-commuter rail, and you get a model that aligns very closely with the economic patterns. Um, I think what you heard was in the beginning, tourism was a fairly limited 
statistical world, it has become increasingly sophisticated as local economies and state economies, and to a large degree the U.S. economy, has become dependent upon it. In essence, at the U.S. level, we're an export industry, and we are the largest or second largest export service industry in the U.S. You wouldn't necessarily know that at the federal level right now, but it continues to be so, and it's particularly so in New York City. Um, domestically, for the city, our numbers look a little different than other places. Right now, 49 and a half, right? 49.2 million domestic visitors, 12.6 million international visitors. That 20% of visitation to New York from foreign visitors accounts for almost 50% of the spending. Mm -hmm. They are longer stay, overnight, and even if they're visiting friends and relatives, the money they're not spending on a hotel, we find them spending shopping, restaurant, and entertainment. Um, the domestic market, American travel is local, regional, and long haul. So New York State, New Jersey, Connecticut are our top metro market. Philadelphia is by and large the largest single metro area that feeds into New York, and Philly will tell you the same about us. So we are, as a state, as a city, the two things work together, um, and people, depends on the length and the type of the trip, they don't just go to one place. Um, I love the friends and relatives who come to stay with you in Westchester because they get on Metro North and they come into the city. Um, that's that my non-commuter rail impact. <clears throat> so the projects are statistically based. I would argue that we as an industry have gotten much more sophisticated and held ourselves to much higher standards um, of what we need to know, how we get that information, how we answer the questions for each of our partners and stakeholders, because this is really big business. Um, and New York in 2016, that's the last year I have data, it was $42 billion in direct spend, a little bit more, $62 billion in economic impact. <laughs> um, and I wrote it down. $1.82 billion in state tax revenue for us. So, and that was up. Um, to the city, it's closer to $5 billion. And there's also a federal tax contribution, $11 billion a year in revenue to various <clears> government <throat> entities from the business we're all in. So when people say to you, why are you doing this? It's jobs and taxes and really support for the economy of the city or the region. Mm -hmm. um, always happy to answer specific New York City questions. Um, email is always the best way to get those answers. Thanks, Donna. Um, I know this has been very comprehensive, and I, I do want to open it up for questions. And if anybody has other business, we just have to be mindful of our time here. But um, I'm, I'm just curious, with what your work is, since you've been doing our state for so long, if we are indeed, and this is my competitive nature perhaps, but if we are indeed now the second uh, largest visitor state in our nation, what is the first and how far <laughs> behind are we finally become number one? Like we no, are. It, it, it shifts around. Oh, come on. Have yes. we ever been California, number one? California, Florida, New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has New York State ever been number one, though? Um, I don't know. I don't think so, right? No. But it's, it's How far behind close. are we? No, no, it's... <laughs> really close. It's really close. It's really close. All right, so I mean, what do we have to do? I mean, this is what the TAC has to think about. It's <laughs> <laughs> <It's> meeting. <laughs> so much again. Of it. Close again. Oh to get us to be number one. Theme park. No, just yeah, well, we are in yeah. West, in uh, Legoland. In, in Legoland. Legoland. There you go. Okay. Legoland. I mean, you are in, I wouldn't know. in the state <laughs> context, um, like I said, the person trip model mm -hmm. is counting those kids. 
Okay. So Orlando and <laughs> Southern California and parts of Florida, which are very heavy family <clears throat> travel destinations, have more person trips. They don't necessarily have a higher economic impact. Yeah, it's yeah. true. So the hmm. cost of visiting some of the places makes a difference. From both better and worse, New York City has the highest ADR, average daily room rate, of pretty much anywhere in the country on an annual basis. Right now, in January, it costs more to go to Honolulu, generally for a reason. Mm -hmm. They have palm trees and warm weather. <laughs> right now, we've got 50 degrees, but no palm trees in here. So their room rates are much higher than ours, and they have not added to the inventory in the same way that the city of New York or the, this metro region. And you were talking earlier about some of the things that ha are happening across the state. The infrastructure development yeah. is pushing. It, it's not simply if you build it, they will come. But if you build it and you market it well, <laughs> they may very well show up. Starting first with the, the drive market and then a longer haul market and then a broader awareness. Um, that's the rule, and it's not just New York. And Mark Lee, you know this. I mean, you've been at it, I won't say how much longer than I have, but longer than I have. So it's, I think the competition is not just counting people, but counting how many days they stay and what they do and how much they're able to send. Hey, Donna, you, for the last several years, NYC and company has had the initiative to be a little bit more kid-friendly, right, to, oh, be, yeah. to that point. So, right, you have the Dora, Dora the Explorer type of marketing campaign that, mm -hmm. that NYC and company has done and several other themes throughout the, year, mm -hmm. the years. Have you seen, has that made a difference, and has it, be, is there more of a thoughtfulness of you are starting to get more of the families and kids, and is that something that we should think about yeah. through the rest of the state? Two things. Um, what I said before, build it, market it, and they will come. Oh, okay. So we have two More things that have happened in New York City at the same time. The hotel inventory in the city, which has grown by 50% in the last decade, um, we tend to say we swallowed the entire inventory of San Francisco. <laughs> We're now up to San Francisco in the Bay Area. I'm talking 50,000 hotel rooms added. A significant portion of that is located in neighborhoods outside the key business district in the boroughs, around <laughs> the ends and edges of Manhattan, but also what you refer to as limited or select service. They are hotels that make it easier for families to travel here. They are built to accommodate families. They offer free Wi-Fi and free breakfast. Their locations, their pricing are much more accommodating, bad pun, um, to the family traveler. So we see this happening on the ground in the infrastructure. You have an opportunity as generations change the way they travel, and you create opportunities to tell particular stories. The Family Ambassador Program, as we called it, and right now it's the Teenage Ninja Turtles. Um, Teenage Ninja Turtles are interesting because apparently if you grew up with them, you never grow out of them. <laughs> you can feel like you outgrew Dora the Explorer or Sesame Street, but there's something about the Ninja Turtles that I talk to colleagues all the time and they get really <laughs> excited um well, no I, judgment I never there. thought I would say this but I just bought tickets to Spongebob Squarepants <laughs> having yeah. grown up and hated Spongebob <laughs> but I, wow. I, I'm told it's a good show so I hear it's a good show so the, Gail to your question yes we have seen an increase in family travel um particularly from the domestic market the international market, it was always a very small share. It's inched up maybe one point or two points. 
But on the domestic market, it's a huge difference. The other piece is the story you tell about the destination and the things that matter to family travelers, whether it's safety or um, sustainability now, um, other things that people care about mm -hmm. when they travel with their kids. And both of those stories work really well at the state level. So, Michael, I'm curious, without divulging any uh, secrets from your other uh, clients, although I'm going to ask you to, <laughs> uh, just on this, on this topic, I mean, Vegas, for example, started to go into that family-friendly stuff, right? And just, but now I've, I've read that they've pulled back on that. Was that part of your... Didn't work. Ah, the the family stuff didn't work well, in Vegas, right? <laughs> I, 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 think about it. I, 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 I know, yeah. but it did they figure it out from your money? Of, I mean, from your from your numbers? Or it was. They... It was basic. No, no, it wasn't because of us. Um, only about a third, thirty percent of uh, vacations involve children. Really? And overall, or just in actually in that's domestic right. trips? Domestic right. trips. Okay, okay. So when you get down to Vegas level. Uh, it was very small, but I, I assume that some consultant convinced <laughs> marketers that it was a, a, a good idea and a, an untapped market. But you've got to have product, right? You've got to have lots of product. And, and that product has to keep changing, especially with kids, right? It's like theme parks. You can't just have one ride. You've got to have ride after ride after ride every year. Although you're <laughs> 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 But it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's all running for a while. But don't get it done right. The number of, of families uh, with kids traveling to Orlando, for instance, would be probably closer to 70% of visitation, whereas in New York, it may be 20%. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, um, a gazillion more questions, but um, we're running out of time. So um, I want to thank our guests for coming in. You're welcome to come to any TAC meeting. It's open, but we'd love to keep up the progress. Bob, I know you're, you're you know, you, you come in and out occasionally, but we'd love to see more of you. Sure. So, um, so our Ross next. lets me out. <laughs> <laughs> our next meeting He's is day tripper. Day tripper. Right? So more than 50 miles. Right? So we're counting you. Please keep inviting him. <laughs> <laughs> well, our next meeting is in Albany. Though. Yeah, there we go. All right, so, so invite me. That's right. <laughs> right, and then we can count you in the statewide. Yep. It all helps each other. Uh, but it's on March 12th. It's tied to Tourism um, Advocacy Day. So uh, some of you will be up there anywhere, anyway lobbying our electeds on the importance of tourism. If you're not, there's a whole program. So uh, we hope to engage you in that fight. fight with this, uh, flag, sure. Any uh, last minute open business issues that you want to raise? Cat schools are doing gangbusters, I hear, right? You know a lot about it? Going well, Christine. All right. I just want to say that Bob Hines is probably the most popular guy that TPAs uh, oh. are going to in the month of June. We know you like to go on vacation because we've got to get those numbers. Because <laughs> it's the most reliable data that we get to monitor how we're doing. And as one of the people here mentioned, you know, we do have bosses, we do have stakeholders yes, that you care about that. So we really rely on this. <laughs> great job. Well, then maybe you shouldn't show up at so many meetings because you have to get that data to rip by June. Yeah. yeah. Or May. Yeah. Talk to the suppliers about that one. So we, we okay, so I need to adjourn this meeting, and I I, uh, I need somebody to. So moved. So moved. Okay. Second. Thank you. All right, meeting is adjourned. It is now, I think, 1240. All right, thank you all. See you in uh, Albany on March 12th.